Hello everyone, my name is Claudia Morales and I'm super excited. I have Chief Ajua sitting right next to me. He's here at the library because he has a concert tonight. And welcome Chief. Oh, thank you for having me. We are super excited. We're waiting for a while for this concert, so it's very special. <laughs> yeah, me too, right? I'm like, all right, let's go. Let's and go. you're here tonight for a concert. You are going to do a combination of your new work mm -hmm. and some of your other uh, yeah, projects. All the yep, mm -hmm. all the records. Yeah. And but before we go into that, I want to get your reaction. Uh -huh. For the ones who don't know, the music division has over 25 million items in its collection. It's a very vast collection. Wow. And we pull some items from the Charles Mingus collection, from Ella Fitzgerald, from Hazel Scott, from uh, Max Roach papers. Mm -hmm. And I, we just spent the last hour talking about that and getting some reactions and viewing some, uh, some items. So Chief, yeah. tell us about your, your, your reaction. Well, I'm floored, you know, and um, you know, it's, it's actually hard to get past the sort of uh, the emotion of gratitude, really. Mm. Um, you know, it is not, uh, you know, it's not the, the nominative experience that we have when we go into reservoirs for creative pa uh, practice, mm -hmm. for there to be this kind of um, extensive, um, uh, you know, all these coffers of information and history. And to, to have the, the experience of being able to put my actual hands <laughs> on the chart, uh, that Charles Mingus made, you know, mm -hmm. and, and see his his guides, and and to, to to also have the ability to go back into what I've heard my entire life mm -hmm. in the recordings, mm -hmm. and see the things that created the prompts, mm -hmm. you know, musically in those ways. It's like, yeah, you kind of can't beat that experience, you mm -hmm. know. So like my, um, um, like if you could if you could see my spirit in this moment, it's just, <laughs> you know, it's just like, um, you know. I just feel all light, mm -hmm, you know what mm -hmm, I mean? Mm -hmm. And um, like having an experience like that arms you with so much, you know, in addition to kind of checking out the things that exist in the, the musical orbits of these uh, great practitioners, you know, you also uh, curated a, an experience for us that was calibrated around uh, what they share with each other, mm -hmm. practitioner to practitioner, human being to human mm -hmm. being, about what they're experiencing in that time. and. Um, you know, reading some of the things that um, that Nina Simone wrote to Hazel Scott about the things that uh, she was seeing and her kind of appraisal of like um, the the uh, the uh, the American situation at that time. Mm -hmm. um, those are the things that um, are also really um, affirming mm -hmm. uh, for us that you know that there is a trajectory and that um, there's a certain level of work that is uh, requisite to to do this at the highest level. And that is also tethered to, uh, you know, you being honest and clear about what your actual experience mm -hmm. is. And um, more often than not, when these kinds of things are being framed for the next generation or young people, uh, they're, they're not really getting the reality of what these people's lifetimes mm -hmm. were. Um, oftentimes they're getting sort of, uh, you know, even if, if it's in a book or even if it's like a, a Netflix documentary mm -hmm. or some film composite about said artist. Um, it's usually done from the imagination from people that don't have a relationship to the actual cultures mm -hmm. and therefore kind of limited in, in the, the sort of appraisals of the realities that these people are enduring and creating from. So just having the opportunity to be able to see those, these kinds of things, not just for me, obviously, like I said, it's making my spirit feel mm -hmm, radiant mm -hmm. and I could like float out of the room. But I think um, having forums like this that also help uh, younger younger people build a more comprehensively built composite of what uh, the history of this music mm -hmm. is, um, what its efficacy in, in changing some of those realities mm -hmm. of the, the um, American conundrum as we all kind of live through it mm -hmm. and, and are, you know, waking up every day to try and make this place a more perfect union. Mm -hmm. I think it's, um, it's really cool to see um, that, you know, maybe some of the things that may be frustrating to us in this moment, that um, not only are you enduring that and going through that and trying to figure out the best way to move forward in this time and in this space, uh, but there were others that in other time, mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe in the same spaces, but in other times, uh, were gr grappling with the same things and, and doing the good work of trying to, to move the ball forward. Mm -hmm. So um, honestly, I'm just, in my culture, we don't bow, but I am bowing to you in this moment for being so considerate and thinking of us and what our experience could be. And so now I'm looking forward to um, reciprocate through our music from the great gift that you gave us today. 
Oh, thank you so much. Well, we, I'm, I'm more than thrilled that mm. you really had that experience mm. on you. That's why we want it. And it's important yeah. for us that, to make sure that our collections are available. Mm. Right. And you, as an artist yeah. on the ground, on mm. stage, know that and that mm -hmm. This this is for yeah, you. I can't wait to, to come back. You know, I'm just like you and know. spend time yeah, and and like and take a deep like dive. <laughs> you mentioned a very yeah. cool story with your your grandfather, yes. Big Chief yeah. Donald. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. My granddad, Big Chief Donald Harrison, Sr. Yeah. He was a huge um, I, and it, it, he just he just loved the music. You know, he had one of the largest re uh, record collections in the region. Oh wow. And uh, when I was in uh, high school, I got to the New Orleans Center for Creative Arts, which is a high school where a lot of New Orleanian musicians uh, go to, um, their music library was almost exclusively my grandfather's records. Oh, wow. Yeah, thousands of records that he donated. And uh, I was actually pretty upset <laughs> uh, when I first, my first day of school, well, because it's like, I, I'm sorry, I'm telling a long-winded version oh, of the okay. story, but, but uh, my first day of school at uh, NOCA, uh, I went into the library and I was like, let me see what records they have. And I'm mm -hmm. going through all these boxes and boxes of records and they all, they all have these little placards, little stickers on them that say Donald Harrison Sr. <laughs> Donald Harrison Sr. I'm like, yo. I, you know, it's like I'm living, you know, I grew up in that home. Uh -huh. right? And I'm like, he gave away thousands of <laughs> records right before I started playing. Right? What about me? <laughs> right. So at home, you know, they may, they may have been a, a few hundred, you know, uh -huh. which is not a little bit for an 11, 12, 13-year-old to be working and digesting. But, um, but all of the records were at, at my high school, so I had to listen to his records there. But, um, but there was a song when I was really small and I first started to, to learn to, uh, to play. Um, that he would always play for me and try to get me to kind of pantomime my way through. Uh, it's called Goodbye Poke Pie Hat. Mm -hmm. And um, it's written by Charles Mingus, and, and, and it was definitely one of um, uh, his go-tos. Yeah, any, it, it felt to me like any time he was, you know, kind of going through moments where he was kind of reevaluating things about his own lifetime and, and, and maybe even thinking about... Um, you know his own impermanence. Mm -hmm. um, he would play the song, mm. but um, hmm. you know, and so I there I can think of my sense of memory is just feels like there, there must have been at least fifty instances of him playing that song mm -hmm. for me mm -hmm. and me like um, terrorizing the recording, <laughs> you know, trying to figure it out, you know. But um, but there are many, you know, even the um, uh, you have a tisket and a task mm -hmm. there too, mm -hmm. same relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the first videos that I ever saw, jazz music video. Mm -hmm. um, was uh, this video of Ella Fitzgerald on the tour bus, mm -hmm. with, you know, and, um, and, and, and I viewed that with my family, and I don't remember if my grandfather was in the room, but, um, but he certainly played those records from that time period in those bands, you know, Chick Webb and those, those big bands out of Harlem in those spaces. So, so yeah, honestly, I'm just like um, really grateful, but also I feel, I feel him mm -hmm. in this moment as mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. you know, um, just because there's, there's so many um, kind of seeded moments to my relationship mm -hmm. to this music that mm -hmm. he was there for, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we also um, uh, had a moment to, to, to look through some of uh, Max Roach's work as well, and I just it just brings me back to the, my infancy as a musician. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. The first record my Uncle Donald gave me when I was 11 years old um, was a Clifford Brown and Max Roach record. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, just the level of what it is that they contributed. Mm -hmm. You know, you have trumpet players and musicians, some drummers, some guys that, um, you know, they play well into their 50s, 60s, 70s, and they're still trying to deal mm -hmm. with what Max was dealing with when he was in his early 20s. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, and, and particularly for a trumpet player, Clifford Brown, I think he died I want to say either 24 or 27, but he was very young. He was very young, yeah. 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 And, um, you know, I'm 40 years old now, and um, there isn't a single time that I practice where I don't have to touch something that Clifford Brown touched. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. the level, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and um, for a 22, 23-year-old person mm -hmm. to, do, um, to get into that is really incredible. But, but yeah, it starts with, with, for me, from when I'm a very small kid mm -hmm. you know I, even i picked up the trumpet pretty late for a new orleanian most kids are playing around three or four years old i started at 11. so you know they'd be like you'll never be able to play you're too old you know this, <laughs> this three kinda. and four year olds 
Oh yeah. Playing yeah. the trumpet. Oh yeah, yeah, cornets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, but yeah, I was small and you know, but but he realized that that I was um, you know, I was excited enough to be to hopefully become serious about mm -hmm. it. And I think he wanted to turn on that, like to really uh, turn on that excitement. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so he gave me Clifford Brown and Max Roach. And as soon as I heard that, I had that was turned, it. I didn't look. Back. I haven't looked back. Mm -hmm. Your mom was an over, over player. Yes, right? um, bassoonist and a clarinetist. Yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How did she influence your your oh, playing? Whew. I mean, tons of it. I mean, the first thing is that I she's the person that that. Um, I'm musically literate because of my mother, mm -hmm. right? She's the person that taught me to read. Mm -hmm. um, I could read music before I played music. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you're just sitting down at the piano and going over different things and, like, you know, trying to, to understand this. What is this concept? But, you know, once I got a little more serious and had been playing for a couple months and different things, you know, it's like she would sit down with me in our living room every day and, like, clap through rhythms. Mm -hmm. and, and, and all of the... Um, the small things that, like, generally when you're in this kind of forum or you're doing an interview that no one ever is curious about <laughs> or asks about, but that's, like, really fundamental stuff that every musician has a sort of origin story, mm -hmm. you know, um, but she was also able to curate really cool kind of experiences for my, my twin brother Kyle mm -hmm. and I when we were small and were, like, around the arts and exposing us to things. Um, so, you know, in addition to her being a, a, a great player in her youth and teaching me to read and all of the different things, you know, when I was a little boy, she, she was also a person that could say, well, oh, have you liked this sound? And you check mm -hmm. out Rochelle Farrell and Michelle and Diego and Cello. This mm -hmm. is like maybe I'm in high school, this mm -hmm. kind of thing. Uh, versus, you know, actually, well, no, what, this thing is really actually giving me a little bit more Nina Simone mm -hmm. or Lena Horne or mm -hmm. Hazel Scott and different things. So she... Um, because she touched music, she had that ear, mm -hmm. and um, that was a really, really um, a fun time as a young person mm -hmm. being surrounded by all of these elders that had knowledge mm -hmm. of, of what it was that I was interested in, you mm -hmm. know? So, so I, always, I always say that, you know, I wasn't an accident, and it was built, and I like to feel like the um, byproduct of an incredible amount of... Um, nurturing and guidance mm -hmm. and um and um and care mm -hmm. uh but yeah she was it, was it was a lot of fun fun growing up in a house that had uh that many folks in the in the home that could kind of uh hip you to what was going on because you have your your mother yep. as a musician mm -hmm. then uh your grandfather yep. then your uncle mm -hmm. saxophonist mm -hmm. but also my grandmother was she was a clarinetist and a composer uh as, as well in her youth so so even the grandparents were musicians mm -hmm. and all four of their children mm -hmm. were musicians as well. Obviously, my Uncle Donald, right? Right, right, right. <laughs> you started playing with him at 16, when you were 16 uh, years old, about that? 12. 12. Yeah, I started touring internationally consistently and not, and, 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 uh, not going to school at 16. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like I, I started hitting with him when maybe 12 or 13 years old. And I would play dates in New Orleans and then... You know, every now and again, he may say, okay, come and do a gig in New York. Or mm -hmm. We're doing something with the symphony in Chicago, and I want you to play and have that experience. But by the time I got to be 16, um, the high schools that I went mm -hmm. to, or specifically the arts high school, NOCA, they let you test out of some elements of the curriculum, but it's only a three-year-based program. So, um, But since they let you test out, the first year I was there, I tested out of the curriculum. And so most most, if I had classes in my first year, it was really redundant things mm -hmm, and things mm -hmm. that they were like, well, we have to put you somewhere. But the le next three years I was at the school, I kind of was a ronin for the teachers, it was kind of like a teacher's assistant mm -hmm. um, kind of energy. And, um, and so, yeah, it's like, um, yeah, just processing that, that, that time. Um, you know, I'm 16 years old and and I don't, my school experience is very different from mm -hmm, others mm -hmm. because really I don't have any classes. I'm a teacher's assistant mm -hmm. at this point. And, um, and so it was easy for me to go on the road mm -hmm, those years. Mm -hmm. so, so I think in a lot of different bios or, or other people kind of writing about what happened during that time period. Mark 16 as the beginning mm -hmm. because this is the moment where it's like you can see I'm I see. out for 200 days with I this see. guy. I see, I see, I see. And exactly. what did your mom say about it? Was she okay? Uh, she wasn't. She wasn't. You know, I'm a mom, was, so yes, I have to. Yeah, that was that, in some moments that was really difficult for her. You know, she mm -hmm. was um, uh, the the 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the the prevailing wisdom was that you know having a fifteen year old you know running around uh, you know Shanghai by himself is an mm -hmm. ideal. <laughs> so, <laughs> so if my baby comes with you, you have to make sure that he's okay. You know, he's okay and he's being um, um, chaperoned in mm -hmm. certain ways. But my uncle Donald was really. Um, he, he did that really delicately mm -hmm. and like gave me enough space for me to to kind of test the walls a little mm -hmm. bit but was always there to kind of uh, course correct mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but um but yeah about 16 um you know I, I might have been in school maybe I don't know five or six weeks mm -hmm. that year mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. that kind of thing because I was I was on the road and the teachers Mr. Kerr and uh, Clyde Kerr and Kent Jordan uh, incredible practitioners mm -hmm. and master level practitioners and the guys that brought me up they were um, they were also very supportive of me going and getting that component of the curriculum that they knew would be requisite for mm -hmm. me to survive music. Mm -hmm. So it was it was true mentorship in that it wasn't about me fitting into some sort of systemic framing of how you learn this music. Mm -hmm. It was about um, me being prepared in all of the ways that I could be prepared mm -hmm. and the group supporting that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Going back to the collections. <clears throat> We just view some, as you mentioned, some of these uh, great artists. Mm -hmm. That now we're talking about your family, mm -hmm. your upbringing, mm -hmm. your education. Yeah. How do you feel about that? Mm -hmm. Now you are, so you are here as mm -hmm. a musician yeah. with all these years mm -hmm. uh, of experience mm -hmm. of of talking the talk and walking the walk, yes, and reflecting on this mm -hmm. artist mm -hmm. that you heard growing up. Oh, yeah. But now you are the artist. Mm -hmm. You are kind of like, uh, yeah. <laughs> you are going yeah. to perform at the stage tonight. Mm -hmm. How do you, I guess what I'm trying to ask, how does that affect you? No, knowing that you are not a kid anymore, yeah. you are equally. There's, there's multiple ways it's affecting <laughs> me. No, you, no, I think the, fir the, the baseline and the first thing is to, to, again, to just be grateful for the opportunity mm. to express and to, to mm. try and communicate these things from our experience you know, and especially in a forum like this. So I think that the first thing is just to tap into the gratitude of it, mm. you know, because I'm, I'm also aware of, um, you know, the, the, the 30 other trumpeters in my age range um, that also contribute and work very hard, not to reduce it to the mm. trumpet, but, but that also create really incredible works that are, that are deserving of these, this kind of interaction mm -hmm. and conversation and experience as well. So I try not to, um, I appreciate it, but I also try not to um, to, uh, to to get out of the way. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I understand that um, the beautiful thing about this community is that it is that, mm -hmm. and that the the strength in the expression is also um, being willing to recognize that the the synergy between what all of us mm -hmm. are trying to express mm -hmm. about our human experience. You know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, as someone that has done it for such a long time mm -hmm. now, and and is encroaching into a space now where a lot of the musicians that I interact with view me as the elder. Mm. And, you know, it's like I'm, I'm 40 years old. I got my first beard. It came in patchy and it's got gray. <laughs> it's got grays kind of going on. Um, but, you know, whenever I'm with the younger musicians now, um, you know, we were talking about my mm -hmm. the new band that mm -hmm. I have, the mm -hmm. younger babies, you mm -hmm. know, Elay and Rayoma and these guys, and they're 19, 20 years old. And they've... Um, they grew up listening to my music. Mm -hmm. You know, I met the drummer that plays with our group uh, now when he was six years old, and he told me when I first met him that he had been listening to my music for a long time. <laughs> and so it's a weird thing when the folks that are coming into your band or your environment now, um, they learn to speak music mm -hmm. through your mm -hmm. languages, mm -hmm. your um, contribution. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it, when I say I'm going through multiple things and mm -hmm. processing and trying to reconcile all of those things, it, it can be as, it can be really um, fun and beautiful in that it's like that, that's a cool thing, mm -hmm. you know, for, for this person that have listened to all your work their entire life and to know how to express in that way. But it also, like, I'm not unaware of the responsibility mm -hmm. um, that comes with uh, being in a position where there's an expectation to guide and to lead. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's just important to kind of stay grounded and rooted in the right thing and the reality of the thing because it's not, you know, when we're dealing with these younger musicians, it's not just about them learning to be able to, you know, uh, 
uh, to be able to play a drum solo or any of these things. It's also about them learning to be able to feed their family mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, to, to, um, to, to try and grow into the best men that they can be, the best people that they can be, and the music kind of serving as a conduit for them to develop deeper understanding about all of it. And um, seeing these histories and now being a part of that um, legacy, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I'd be lying if I said it wasn't heavy, you know, because you realize that it's um, what's really at stake. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. And then the last thing is just like, um, you know, there's there's also the moment where you're you're also um, like, uh, um, you know, it's 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 an interesting thing to have a to have a dream and to work at a dream, and then um, uh, when you realize that, um, yeah, you have a dream and you invest in and you put all of this energy into trying to actualize those mm -hmm. things, and. Um, and some of those things come to fruition, but it's the things that you don't anticipate and expect about it. You know, like I think when I was first learning to play, I never thought about being in this chair right mm -hmm. now and for people to, to view me as the a person that has contributed all of these things mm -hmm. and um, for such a long time and tried to move the ball forward. Like, it, it's, from my perspective, it's still odd because mm -hmm. I'm also still the guy that was the 11-year-old little boy mm -hmm. trying to learn how to play mm -hmm. the Tiger Leaf Rat. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it, it's it, the best way I could put it is it, it's kind of hard to reconcile all of the <laughs> all of the different kind of energies and the emotions around it. Mm -hmm, right. Because, mm -hmm. um, again, um, you know, I also am very aware of the fact that, like, even the things that people attribute to what I've contributed, it's not just me contributing. So mm -hmm. it's, it's always the larger thing, I think, that comes to mind when I think of those kinds of things, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's like, um, yeah, the community of it and also being fortunate enough to live long enough to even be in this chair mm -hmm. in those spaces. Like, I can think of musicians, you know, thinking of Travis and Trumpet Black in New Orleans and this guy, you know, just, just so many musicians that are not no longer with us that mm -hmm. had something to say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I, I don't I don't take it lightly. You know, I, I think um, all of these things, these talisman, this uh, reservoir for creative practice and, you know, the coffers of our history, um, all of these things are of uh, great utility and great importance. So, so, I, so I, I take it seriously. Mm -hmm. Speaking about something to say, mm -hmm. stretch music. Yeah. Does you are the creator of the stretch music? Mm -hmm. Is a you know it, it's a community. <laughs> it's a community. It right? is. It's it a is. Community. Yeah. But mm -hmm. gender blind mm -hmm. kind of um, mm -hmm. vision. Yep, like genre blindness. Yes. Incarnate. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, tell us a little bit about that, and mm -hmm. um, I'm curious to know how you also reconcile mm -hmm. the the fact that it's always been collaborations and um, inspiration and mm -hmm just this exchange between mm. different parts of the music from different parts of the world. Mm. Nowadays, people call it sometimes world music mm. or different, they put di different, different names. How do you define or what is, how is that different from your approach to stretch music mm. to this mm. historically mm. contribution from different musicians of different parts of the world? Well, I, you know, I, I think there's always more synergy than less, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. And, and, and part of the reason that, like, when you say, you know, you're the creator or progenitor of stretch music, I do that, mm -hmm. is because, it's like, you know, it, all of it also has a trajectory, mm -hmm. right? Like, I'm not here without Nouveau Swing. Right. Right? And um, those, those, that was the sound that when I was growing up that I cut my teeth in, at least from a, a training sense and also from a kind of... Um, um, learning conceptually from the, the ground floor up what's really going on in, mm -hmm. a, in, a, in a thread line of music through my uncle, right? Mm -hmm. But I grew up in a community that's gonna, you know, in New Orleans you learn the music in canon, right? So I can't walk into Preservation Hall and say, let's play Donna Lee, which was written by Miles Davis mm -hmm. in the 40s, uh, without understanding how to play West End blues, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Um, so they're gonna say no, little Harrison. That's that's too late. You have to mm -hmm. you have to go back mm -hmm. and play the stuff that's at the beginning. So the the part of the reason I that it's it's important to be honest about uh, the larger trajectory of mm -hmm. it is that is th these things are all still related, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like it's like um, 
for lack of this may be a terrible example, but for lack of a better way of putting it, it's like if you look at like um, theology for, mm -hmm. for a moment, right? You look at the Abrahamic religions, right? Mm -hmm. So you look at the, the Torah, the Bible, and the Quran. S some people will look at those things as completely separate and sovereign kind of energies. Mm -hmm. But like if you know the histories of those theologies, you know that there's synergy between them. Now, someone that is reading the Quran, there are obviously vestiges of things that exist in the Torah mm -hmm. in it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so to say that it is just that to me is really limited mm -hmm. because actually it's the it what we're doing is a composite that is built from this legacy and this mm -hmm. canon that has existed since before we had a frame for the music, mm -hmm. since before. Um, you know, the music was even being played on these kinds of instruments. Mm -hmm. so, so it's important to, to be um, clear about that, I think. Uh, I think in terms of what stretch music is doing and how it um, um, is different from some other approaches, as I, as I think the, the main thing is that the intentionality behind genre blindness um, being rooted in sort of decolonizing the sound mm -hmm. in a way um, that allows musicians from seemingly disparate cultural groups to uh, to enjoy their time together mm -hmm. uh, rather than constantly being bogged down with this out uh, who is and is not eligible mm -hmm. for creation. Um, this is something that um, was really important to me as a younger person because I could see the, the for lack of a better way of putting it kind of colonial puppet mastery in hand kind of the strings of why the genres were being separated mm -hmm. and, and who is who is valid enough to learn to play mm. this versus who's, who is not who's eligible not. for that. Yeah. All of those things were a part of um, my upbringing. I saw those things. And so it was important to me to try and create uh, and contribute something that forced people to reevaluate all of those lines that we've been drawing mm -hmm. in the sand, right? Mm -hmm. Because when someone says, um, and I'm sorry to run on, but, but when someone says, you know, visualize a Western classical musician, mm -hmm. and then they say visualize a salsalero, mm -hmm. they see different people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So t it was um, pretty blatant and like really clear to me as a young person, uh, like this is hyper-racialized, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and even as a 10-year-old, 11-year-old, wanting to understand why that was, right? And you know, you mature, you get a little bit older and you learn about uh, the fact that radio program is exactly that programming, mm -hmm. um, and you know you learn and you're paying attention to the things that you're hearing. You say, well, why is this particular community being, uh, in terms of the nutritional value that exists in music, mm -hmm. why is this community being fed this, and this community mm -hmm. being fed that? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and so you you begin to see the kind of lines that are drafted um, that that keep groups of people in very strange holding patterns. And I think for, for, for the black community in America specifically, um, there, there is a sort of constant, um, it seems like there's a, this, a campaign, you know, you know, to, to sort of um, make sure that what's being fed to this community doesn't at large doesn't really have a nutritional value mm. that it that it it, it um seeds uh narratives and and vibrational th energies mm -hmm. even within the how the music is built um that feeds a very uh specific sort of vibrational mm -hmm. level right and 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 you know if we're being honest about you know the reality of the music industry it's like you, you don't have to look at the genre to see that. You can just look at the equity that doesn't exist for artists and know that something is amiss, mm -hmm, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. so, so all of those things are being faced um, and, um, and, and fought in, in what it is that we're trying to do musically mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because it is, as much as it deals with being able to mix a bolero uh, with something that might come from traditional gamma music you know, or something that comes from traditional you know, uh, let's say Japanese music or Kodo music, or to be able to mix these things is um, it's 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 also really important in that it, it creates a, a way for people to have conversations about the differences in their perceptions of mm. their own cultures mm. of music um, that allows you to be able to move forward and to also create um, a, 
a larger dialogue about like why one way is the way in one community versus mm. versus why it's it's that way in another and what that expression does to the community, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. How how do we take the things that maybe come from Guanguanco music and salsa and put those into a black community in American context uh, that allows us to be able to um, to also benefit from vibrationally what's happening here that might not exist in something like trap music. Mm -hmm. And that's not to, to denigrate that form, mm -hmm. but it's, it's to say it's important to look around mm -hmm. and to share stories. And the music is really calibrated around that energy, a mm -hmm. sharing. You know? mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Speaking of that, mm -hmm. your newest work, mm -hmm. It seems to me, correct me if I'm wrong, but no. that's in your trajectory, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, your journey as a musician, mm -hmm. it seems like this is your, mm -hmm. your you are in, like, in this moment of um, looking inside. Fierce re <laughs> yeah, <obviously. laughs> yeah. like, <laughs> like looking into different, like different, aspects of your persona yes. of who you are mm -hmm. becoming as a musician and as mm -hmm. a person it has you have done maybe your your largest uh stretch mm -hmm. or jump mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. i can see that in this in this work mm -hmm. would you would you agree on that yeah i think um it's interesting because it's it's what part of what it's calibrated around was just um conversations with other musicians that were um, trying to figure out how to stretch music mm -hmm. and levying concerns about what they felt they were and were not eligible mm. for because of type. Again, it, it always right, goes back right, to the same right, thing. Right, 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 right. So it's like, you know, you may have a, a musician that um, has a, is maybe born in Copenhagen and, you know, they, they really want to express what they want to express while maintaining a semblance of respect and decorum for what has already existed and don't know how to do that, mm -hmm. you know? And so there are many ways musically, musical examples, there's, you know, almost two decades worth of musical examples that we can give that person to check out, but that's, it's different when you don't, when you don't know the sound that they're trying to get across. Mm -hmm. And so the record was also calibrated around um, showing that it is okay for us to be um, fierce champions of our own mm, identity politics mm. as a means of reaching across the outside. Mm -hmm. So I, it's an interesting record in, in that because it is so pointed culturally, it can give the impression that what's going on is like so specific and it's this thing and, you know, the Maroons of New mm -hmm. Orleans and he's the chief and there's a new instrument that he created for mm -hmm. this and all mm -hmm. of the things. But it's it's really more me showing that an investment in yourself and where you you come from as mm -hmm. well is it actually has to be the root of you trying to figure out how mm -hmm. to express in other forums mm -hmm. and trying to um, sort of course correct but also to build courage in the next generation of mm -hmm. musicians to, to learn to be fine with who they are. Mm -hmm. Because again, when you learn music here, you know, it can be a very difficult experience to realize that, like, the better you get, the more spaces that you want to gain entry to, mm -hmm. that the, the sort of, uh, uh, the sort of paper bag test, mm -hmm. if you will, for your, for your admission is a real paper bag test, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so it's, um, it's vital that in this moment, uh, we do everything that we can to disrupt that so that the next generation doesn't have to deal with uh, someone musically throwing a paper bag on their skin to see whether or not they're <laughs> right. You, 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 mm -hmm. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Yeah. Uh, so, so the record kind of serves, um, you know, I'm speaking to this in context to stretch me yep. in your yep. question, but because it, it, there are a lot of pillars within the record, but but I think in terms of that context. It, it was also created with the intention of creating uh, an energy that tells you no matter where you're from, what you look like, what you believe, any of these things, that the things that come from your heart and your experience, your personal experience, your cultural experience, um, are valid whether or not someone else says they're valid mm, or not, mm, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, this... And, and also to um, to clarify and complicate some of the 
conversations about the actual history of where this music comes from. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times in America, we kind of codify jazz since it has been viewed as like America's classical music as being equal parts African rhythms and European harmony. It's like the nominal mm -hmm. definition mm -hmm. of jazz, which from the perspective of practitioners is wholly ridiculous mm -hmm. in terms of the root of the music. Mm -hmm. That's to say that there are no harmonic traditions in a continent as, as large as Africa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the, 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 a space that has the most genetic and cultural diversity on the planet mm -hmm. has no harmony. That's ridiculous, right? Mm -hmm. So for us, in order to challenge that, it's difficult to do that in the, in the same frame that everyone has heard. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it requires you stepping out of that space and saying, well, what I'm playing right now comes from a Malian, you know, mm -hmm. something that a Don Soengoni might be mm -hmm. playing in the bush outside of Bamako, mm -hmm. these kinds of spaces. Mm -hmm. And and for some reason, it fits perfectly with something that Nina Simone or Louis Armstrong would do or something that Jason mm -hmm. Moran would do. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's right, because this harmony is actually, there may be vestiges of it where someone touched Satie and Ravel and Tchaikovsky and all these things. Mm -hmm. But in terms of what it actually is, the known thing that it actually is, is, is much more likely that what you're actually hearing is an extension of this uh, Senegambian version mm -hmm. of expressing blues, mm -hmm. you know, what became blues, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, versus, versus the kinds of framing that we put onto what jazz is and is not. Mm -hmm. mm. Your voice mm. in, mm. That, in that record, you use your voice heavily mm. as an instrument. Is yeah. this your, your first time um, mm. exploring that instrument? Yeah, at that well, level? It's, you know, like I grew up singing the traditional maroon songs and the, the songs that are kind of tethered to the, the um, a African, you know, um, sort of uh, cultural expressions of remembrance that we have mm -hmm. in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And uh, so in those forums, um, I've been singing since I was a very mm -hmm. tiny child, mm -hmm. you know, uh, three years old, four years old, trying to learn and sing the traditional songs. Um, but what, what is different about this is that it's those songs that are in that way are contrasted with me expressing with the bow and singing over songs that are as modern as mm -hmm. the most modern thing, mm -hmm. right? So it's like that kind of polarization. And it was uh, building that part component of the record was really difficult, mm -hmm. right? Because you're trying to, to show and build synergy between something that sounds like uh, something that is uh, uh, a field recording from 1921 or the 1790s, mm -hmm. depending on what song I'm expression, expressing, and something that could maybe be a field recording in like 2235, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? And so I, I found that to be the most fun because it was so challenging to, to also to speak over something that feels like a radio head and nine inch nails <laughs> meets Jimi Hendrix kind mm -hmm. of situation but to also try and give it the same fervor that exists in the maroon mm -hmm. uh, kind of uh, Afro and Afro First Nation blues of mm -hmm. Louisiana. Mm -hmm. uh, to, to take that sound and to put it 300 years mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. ahead and to build those synergies was really difficult, but, but uh, some of the most fun I've had making in a record in, in a long time. Were you, at some point, did you, were you concerned about mm. Putting your voice out? No. 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 Did it come? How, how how did you decide that this is this is the, the record that I want to have a vocal mm. part? No, it just it it just um you know I'm a, a big fan of like not forcing mm. things mm -hmm. you know and um, when I started to build the music for this record I didn't hear the trumpet mm. it just started there you know like um you know I think the 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 um you know like the uh, <laughs> the nominative kind of record label like uh, executives like uh, viewing of something like this is like wow you have a brand you know why are you abandoning that you know so many people love the trumpet this kind of thing mm -hmm. but like from the artist standpoint you know they're you know I'm not thinking about that like if, yeah if, if what I had written actually this is pretty funny if what I had <laughs> written was like a flute album with no beats and no rapping <laughs> <laughs> then that's what y'all would have heard you know what I'm saying right. so it's like I think it's but I think it's in this time period that's it's, it's a great example with you know what yeah, I'm yeah, with yeah, 3000's yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. latest but it's um 
the point is, is like you have to allow the artist to yeah, art. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm yes, saying? It's like, yes. So it's like the more that I'm framed as a jazz trumpeter, uh -huh. even when I was 14 years old, uh -huh. and you could, someone could maybe say that that was most of what I was contributing, that was still an incorrect way to frame me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, and it certainly is now, right? Uh -huh. Because there are all these other things. But, but there wasn't a moment where it was like, don't sing, you know? Mm -hmm. and it was like, <laughs> you <know? laughs> yeah. So you are really yeah. challenging the industry, aren't you? Yeah, they, they have to be faced, right? right. It, it has to be faced, right? Because we're talking about, if we're being completely honest, you know, we talk about culturally all of these different kind of um, moments of, um, uh, uh, for lack of a better way of putting it, of abolition and, and emancipation mm -hmm. um, that exists um, in, in our spaces, but a lot of times we don't deal with that from the, the space of the what is being contributed artistically. Mm -hmm. uh, the music industry is a reservoir for indentured servitude and slavery. Mm. Anyone that argues that that is not what is going on is up to something. Mm. And you should run as far away from that person as mm. possible because it's the truth, mm -hmm. right? So I we can't have the conversation from, uh, uh, root the conversation in, in a lie. We have to to be, you know, given these incredible examples that we have mm -hmm. that you showed us, like, no, we have to be honest about what it is because we, we don't grow, we don't move forward if, if we're not doing that, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And how do you manage that? Because first, yeah. so you're, you're, mo like you you're, don't. <laughs> <laughs> you just gotta get, be honest, you know? You're moving away <laughs> from the term jazz. Yes. In a stretch I music. Never, yeah. Absolutely. You're putting down your trump, your uh, your horn for this day. No, you I mean, it's still there. It's still there, but it's and not. It's still there every day for me. There was in a day. Right, you know? right. Yes. But for this album, <laughs> yes. yeah, for the record, yeah. you're doing your you're using your vocal instrument. Mm -hmm. You're doing the harp. Mm -hmm. You're using yeah. this. Oh yeah, uh, Hodge was well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. You're using your um, evoking this mm -hmm. new sounds. This mm -hmm. taking people to different experiences. Mm -hmm. How, is, are you challenging? Do, do, do you feel that you're challenging the industry? Are you are you mm -hmm. feel, are you finding like a pushback? Yeah, it, but that it's it's always that that the pushback always exists around music that outsiders deem mm. as radical because it's tethered to people being honest about them being li fully liberated. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know. Yeah. So so uh, anytime you're creating from a space where you are. Um, yeah, just speaking truth about what your experience is and what you're experiencing in an industry that is calibrated around dispossession, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> then you're gonna yeah, have pushback, yeah, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? There's no way so around like, it. I don't think what we're doing is, is special in that, in that, you know, because we're fighting, yeah. I, think, um, I think that particular fight, even if you're unaware of it, you're a yeah. part of it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you you yeah. get what I'm saying? Yeah. So even a, even a 19 year old kid that's signing a record deal that has no idea what any of it says is a part of that yeah. conversation and right. that fight. But I think what's, what's maybe different is the intention to musically, uh, in every level possible, to try and uh, contribute alternatives mm -hmm. to to the the sort of nominative way of doing it, and that's the the creation of the musical instruments are mm -hmm. are part of that mm -hmm. as well, right? Um, you know, it's um, yeah, you're gonna be fought on you know on on a lot when you're expressing what it is that we're expressing, but it it becomes more difficult for people to be able to put you into one box or mm -hmm. another of what they're looking at and engaging with is something that no one has ever saw. Right, and right. No one has heard. No. Right? Mm -hmm. So so I think we we've, we've learned to use the past and also what can uh, and while simultaneously embracing possibility and trying to contribute and gift new things to the zeitgeist so that the entire mm -hmm. thing can be reevaluated yeah. in a way that um that is, is, is in alignment with the heart conditions of the people that are actually creating said expressions. Your instruments, mm. tell me about them. Oh gosh. <laughs> Your babies. I'm so excited, <laughs> yeah. And there's so many, there's, so, there's just a ton more coming. Um, but the, the ones that uh, folks are going to hear tonight, mm -hmm. uh, you know, obviously my, I, I have my own custom line of B-flat instruments. Mm -hmm. I kind of change and twist up all of these instruments mm -hmm. to try and see what else there is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, cause you know, I'm a person that takes exception to someone levying to me that a, a 200 desi year old design of a cornet or a trumpet is the optimal version of what it is that, that, 
you know, um, once you play the thing, you realize there's ways it can get better. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. to me, um, I think where most musicians are kind of like, okay, I'll play this trumpet, <laughs> <laughs> you know, this kind of thing. I don't accept that, you mm -hmm. know. And so, you know, the horns that I'm playing today, they are some really weird composites. Um, the first one is called an Ajua trumpet. It was mm -hmm. obviously named after me, but it's a, a hybrid of uh, a trumpet and a trumpet's receiver and a flugelhorn body, but with some really cool uh, shepherd's crooks that create this kind of a figure eight mm -hmm. uh, that allows an instrument that is essentially um, built in a way where you, I guess you would say it's, it, it could be construed as like the smallest in the tuba family. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's conical instrument and all of these things. But those instruments usually have a really limited range. I can play almost a five octave range on this instrument oh, wow. that traditionally is only a couple octaves, mm -hmm. right? So uh, in terms of the blow of it, it's va a vastly superior instrument mm -hmm. to its predecessor, right? Mm -hmm. um, the instrument that is maybe more akin to a traditional trumpet as the, the, um, the sort of a tilt -a bell trumpet that I play um, on a lot of songs. It also has some really cool, really subtle changes to it that allow you to be able to do things that you just, um, that at least in my lifetime of playing the trumpet, mm -hmm. um, I can think of maybe two or three practitioners that I know that can get relatively close to really creating three or four different sounds mm -hmm. in the same instrument, like legitimate mm -hmm. different sounds. Mm -hmm. Whereas this instrument is built so that they, um, there is no back pressure. Traditionally on the, the trumpet, you use the resistance of the instrument to be able to achieve the upper register playing mm -hmm. and to get the kind of um, uh, gravitas and kind of force in the mm -hmm. playing. And this instrument is built to where there's none of that resistance oh, is there. Oh, I see. And, and if you are sort of savvy enough to, to, to prioritize maybe breath over vibration at the mouthpiece in certain moments, uh, to use the heat of the air and mm -hmm. temperature of mm -hmm. the air to actually interact mm -hmm. with the brass differently, you can get maybe seven or eight completely different sounds out of this single instrument. Oh, wow. So in terms of its um, utility as uh, what Dizzy Gillespie would call the cool weapons, um, you know, to me it kind of can't be beat because, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, yours has three moves but mine has seven, mm -hmm. right? So if, if I'm trying to communicate something about my human experience or something that I've experienced that, as an example, has a really sharp and contrasting kind of uh, emotive, energetic move. Mm -hmm. um, whereas you may be limited in, and sometimes limitations can create mm -hmm. beauty, obviously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the point is, is that um, whereas you may be limited in turning that phrase, I am not, mm -hmm. right? I have the ability to be able to take something and it can be raucous and extremely um, uh, sort of, um, you know, coming from a space where maybe it hasn't took get lin uh, linear examples. Maybe it's given a lot of heat and anger, mm -hmm. but in a phrase it can move into a moment where it's really rooted more into compassion and obs sort of an observational listening, learning kind of sound that has a sound. Mm -hmm. So it having the ability to make those kinds of turns within the same kind of boxes is, um, well, firstly, it's really fun, but also it just shows that, like, you know, the, the instruments never stop growing. No. You know? Yeah. Um, and then there's the bow. Sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, and then there's the bow, which is um, really, really new. Um, this is a musical instrument that I created, I want to say, 18 months, two years ago. Uh, that was really me uh, two years ago. Sorry. That was really me trying to find... Um, ancestral recall and memory within the methodologies of something that I was mm -hmm. doing in my, in our particular musical orbit. And, you know, I was listening to all of these records, you know, a bunch of rock and roll records, modern rock and roll and contemporary blues and all of this stuff in it. There was no blues in it. Mm -hmm. And, and I, the thing that came to mind was that like, um, the relationship between a lot of practitioners in rock and roll in this moment versus maybe in its inception, uh, the, the relationship to Africanity and the root mm. of where what those rhythms are really doing to your mm -hmm. body and with all of these things, it doesn't exist mm -hmm. for a lot mm -hmm. of these musicians. And so it was important to try and um, figure out a way to reframe something from antiquity that seeded what we now call the mm. blues. Mm -hmm. Uh, and rock and roll, mm -hmm. and uh, but to put it into a format and a template that 
um, allows, because it's not for the rock and roller of today, it's for the rock and roller of tomorrow, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. But it, it allows the 10-year-old now to be able to see that and, and to say, oh, you know, if I interact with that, then it's I get to author uh, my own thing in a mm -hmm. different way because it's new. But what they're actually doing is learning to play um, an 800-year-old West African mm -hmm. Ingoni, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yep, 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 yep. <laughs> right, or yep. a Kora. Yep. So it's a, a kind of a cool way to, um, to kind of slip their, their sort of ancestral memory and those methodologies into it. Um, and what I found is it, it, it forces people to also have to uh, reinvest in what the original instruments were, mm -hmm. right? Like, like if, if you touch Adjua's bow and are only dealing it with it from the space of it being a 21st century composite of those things, and it's like, it's got this cool sound, that's great. But the more you touch it, chances are the more you're gonna wanna go and touch a Kora mm -hmm. or an Ngoni mm -hmm. or a Simbi. Mm -hmm. And to make sure that those things are not lost in these forms of expression mm -hmm. is vital. Right. Right. Yeah. So, so that that that's sort of the work the in, the instruments are kind of helping us embark on. And you said that there are more coming. Oh yeah, lots more. What's coming? coming? Yeah. So, <laughs> so there's there's so so much. I can uh, not all of it I can speak to. Okay. Uh, because we have some NDAs in place at the okay. moment. Okay. Uh, but but some of it I can speak to. You know, we we from from our side we've start just started a new business called Ajua Concepts, mm -hmm. uh, which is you know rather than us continuing to. Um, exclusively make deals with other manufacturing kind of corridors to, to create uh, versions of my visions. Uh, we finally um, invested and seeded a company that is going to invest in our visions ourselves, and, uh, and, and partnering with some really cool uh, companies all over the world that deal with all kinds of materials and, and different approaches, 21st century approaches, uh, to create instruments for this generation that um, that that don't have the same um, re relationship to um, uh, to right and wrong and good and bad mm -hmm. and black and white <laughs> all of those things you know mm -hmm. uh, but but the, the gist of it is is that like um, um, at some point uh, you're you're gonna see a lot more of these instruments and um, you know we we want to be in a position where you know. Um, hopefully by you know the the end of a, the decade you'll you'll also be able to see maybe even orchestras with all of these new kinds of instruments wow. um, that are te tethered to uh, antiquity and a, a new approach um, and and so so I would say in a nutshell that's part some of what is being worked on with the instruments. Well, I just feel so inspired to just. Mm -hmm. Find something in my life and do it on my own. Yeah. Just change it, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing is, it's like for me, it's like I live in that energy, right? It's like it's impermanent. Our life is, you know, it's like I, I could not be here tomorrow. So it's like, you know, my students always ask me these kinds of things. It's, it's you know, like how do you, um, you know, you, you get up every day and you're thinking about this stuff. But it's like to me, it's like it, things have to change, mm -hmm. right? And the one thing that we do know, I have learned about the living experiences, the one thing you can guarantee is going to happen is something's going to be different tomorrow than you expected. Mm -hmm. So, so I think um, sometimes we get we create this sort of um, fear and apprehension about changing things because it means something has to be faced. Mm -hmm. um, but what I've learned is, is that any day that you're lucky enough to get up, you're going to have to face mm -hmm. things. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you may as well. Um, uh, try and face things in a way that allows someone to come behind you and to, to potentially have more comfort, you know, in, mm -hmm. a, in an easier way to go with it and not deal with, this specifically for music, some of the kind of um, traumas that exist around you trying to, 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 to learn this music in this kind of space. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like we're sitting in the room and, you know, to my right and left there are Stradivari instruments and all of these things. It's like, um, as beautiful and as amazing as this is, like, you know, most kids from the hood can't just come in here and touch that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They can't. It's mm -hmm. just the reality of mm -hmm. that, right? Mm -hmm. So the point is, is like they're valuable too. And so we have to make sure that we give them things that also allow them to see their beauty and their value as well. And, and I have found um, that uh, the overwhelming majority of experiences that I have had with the music industry at large and a lot of reservoirs for creative practices extremely closed and um, 
extremely limited to people that are are um, are not resourced, mm -hmm. and um, and and those people are beautiful and valid, and they need things too. So if if it means I got to get my butt up every day and try to work to create things that uh, that makes that easier for them, uh, even if I don't get to see it, mm -hmm. it's, it still has to be done because they are valuable, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you say to the new generation? You mm -hmm. just mentioned that you tell them to face change. Yeah. Change is well, part of life. Well, they don't have a choice. Right, we <laughs> right? just have to, have to do it. Deal, deal. You're going to have to get good at dealing with that. Yeah. Knowing that we, mm -hmm. we just discussed different things that we have to deal in this, in this mm -hmm. industry, mm -hmm. how, how would you, what word of wisdom do you give mm -hmm. to this new generation who are coming out in, the, in a generation of um, artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. Spotify, mm -hmm. and different issues mm -hmm. in the industry? What, yeah. what is a couple of words of wisdom that you have for them? Well, I, well, I think the thing is, the, one of the really important things is just to maintain balance, right? So it's like I had a conversation last night uh, with a really uh, great friend of mine, a brilliant mind, uh, Dr. Margarita Rosa, who's gonna come to the concert tonight. And, um, you know, we were speaking about AI and, and um, how um, scary the tool is for a lot of people, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I think there was something that came out recently with, like, they did like an AI version of a Bad Bunny song. Oh yes! And everybody was like, "This is killing," <laughs> you know. And so, you know, I think his reaction was like, "Man," you know. But, but you know, I think it's. Um, but what we talked about was, you know, the fact that this is it is here to stay. It is not, you know, like at the end of the day, like when the Google search engine came, people were like, libraries will never exist again, you know? True. And to a certain degree, some areas of that were actualized. True. But, but at the end of the day, the, if you look at the balance of it now, it's like, well, no. And rather than going into a library having to sit through index cards for hours to deal with something, now this stuff is at your fingertips. True. Um, I refuse to believe that that is exclusively a bad thing. Mm -hmm. It's not just mm -hmm. like the chat GPT or whatever it is. You know, they're just tools. But I think um, when a young musician is staring down the barrel of having to face that mm -hmm. particular thing, mm -hmm. um, that can be really scary because uh, from a, a computational design aspect, it's really difficult to, to face something that has the ability to just, <laughs> you know, if you haven't had those yeah. experiences, if you haven't listened, if you haven't done those things. So um, my thing to them is that you have to learn to do it now. When I say balance, I mean, mm -hmm. I, what I mean is like the analog and the digital. Mm -hmm. It has mm -hmm. to be the old way and the new, and the way, new way, right? Yeah. Because if, it's, if, it's, if it is exclusively one of them, then at some point you're going to get left behind, mm -hmm. right? Even if it's just the, I'm in the AI world. You know, you could live in that space and be producing in that space, but it's like if I put you in a room with a Kai NPC, you have no idea what to mm -hmm, do in that, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, so you can't, you can pantomime and get relatively close to that thing that Kanye West was doing, mm -hmm. but you're gonna have a very difficult time facing Kanye West because he also has the ability to be right. able to do it in that way and is right. working with other things. So, I, so I, I think it, it has to be the balance. Um, I think the fear mm -hmm. of it. Um, potentially taking away resources and jobs and all of these things, that's a legitimate concern, especially when we what we're talking about is an industry that would rather not pay human beings to do anything. <laughs> right, right. right. <laughs> it's, it's just the reality <laughs> of it, right? So, so, so those are legitimate concerns. Mm -hmm. But again, people are going to find a way, mm -hmm. right? So, so is, and, and I will be honest with you, there are some things that I hear coming out of like AI produced music mm -hmm. that is not what the human being would do mm. <laughs> that are really cool things. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, so it's like, I'm in a space now where I'm, um, you know, workshopping with this new group and we're doing all these new instruments and building new instruments to bring in to the forums that we were talking about mm -hmm. creating uh, soon. But part of it is also, who do we engage with that has the ability to in real time work with the AI to actually play with us? Mm -hmm. There's there there are going to be ways to be able to do that, 
soon, mm -hmm. right? So, so the point is, is like rather than just exclusively looking at it like the bot is taking the job, that also just created a vocation and a job mm -hmm. for the person that has the ability to communicate right. with the AI right. Right. as an instrument, right? Because it is also that, right? So, so I refuse to look at it as um, as something that is going to dismantle what's going on mm -hmm. in this moment. Um, I, I think it, it, its efficacy as a tool um, is actually really clear. Like when I hear the Bad Bunny song, mm -hmm. you know, and I know he was upset about it, mm -hmm. you know. And, and the first thing that I would say too, though, is like it, it is going to be easier for the AI to emulate what you're doing if what you're doing is not, you're not really carrying that. I'm just being honest. <laughs> right. Whoever's mad about it, gonna be mad about it. But I'm just saying that thing is going to have a much more difficult time emulating John Coltrane. Right. <laughs> Period. <laughs> Right, so and that's the reality. It's not to create a value distinction, but the point is, like, if you don't want it to touch you, then you have to try and make yourself untouchable. Right. Right. Um, but if that's not what you're doing, there is there are all types of utilities in being able to deal with this technology. Like, for me, I think being able to go into the machine and say, uh, in E flat minor, uh, can you create a composite that feels like you're mixing? Uh, a bolero with uh, this type of Indian raga, mm -hmm. and it feeds something that is get that. As soon as you hear that, now that inspires something, right? Else, right, and it also gives you something to push up against, right? Um, whereas it is less uh, easy to just to walk into like. Uh, a concert hall where like Anushka Shankar is right, giving a right. concert and say, can, can you, you mix? <laughs> <laughs> right? So, so the point is, is that you, you, um, you take what the tool gives right. you. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah, it's a starting point. It's right. not the end. No, absolutely not. Man. Well, for the ones watching from home, Chief Ajua, tonight at the Library of Congress. Yes, yes. See you next time.